I want to investigate all sorts of different things. And one of the things that came over me a couple of years ago, I picked up a book by a philosopher. Most philosophers are not poets. They can be excellent writers, and they know that. Because they don't deal with imagery, they deal with ideas. And there's a big difference. An image is like a dream. It comes up from the inside of us. And as a poet, I practice. My exercises are practicing to bring up those images so that I can paint the pictures then express that picture. I was reading a book by the philosopher Paul Woodruff. That book was called Reverence, Renewing a Forgotten Virtue. So as a poet, I'm thinking, okay, what kind of imagery would I use to express reverence? the virtue reverence. And then I thought, okay, wait a minute. What imagery expresses justice? What image expresses courage? Virtue, as I personally found, may not be true for you, but what I've found is virtues are a little deeper than emotions. For instance, courage. Courage is not fearlessness. With courage, you have to make a choice of some sort. And you make a choice despite the emotions. Courage is a choice in the face of fear, in the midst of fear, the midst of shame. There's something deep inside of us that decides something. And it activates. A virtue, the word virtue, comes from, it, from the Latin, virtus. It's a feminine word, but it means in Old Latin, manliness. This is a men's conference, and I only found this out a few months ago. Virtue means manliness in the old way. Is that related to the word virile? It is. V-I-R? It, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very veritas is V E R. That's truth. Okay, got yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the virtue, the root of virtue is vir, V I R. Mm -hmm. Or as the, I was raised Catholic, so we pronounce the V as a V. The old mm -hmm. Romans would say weir. Mm -hmm which I always thought sounded silly, but I was corrected when I went to the university uh, that I was the silly one. Uh, virtues are the source of the feelings that prompt us to behave well. Virtues are the source of the feelings. They're not the feelings themselves. The virtue, we have to make a choice. And I, I used to use this on my students down in Red Wing. When you're in bed, in the dark, you can't see anything, but you know who you are. You have a sense of, this is me. I am a witness to myself. No matter how much turmoil is going on, there's a part of you that says, this is me. It may be frightened, it may be terrorized, 
It may be happy, but there is this sense of, this is who I am. When you fall asleep, the images that come through you are the dreams. You do not control the dreams. The dreams come through you. If you have dreams, if you have images that come through you before you have the emotions, before you have all these things, you can be a poet. You record your dreams regularly. You go back and read the recordings of those images as they come. And eventually you'll find out this is poetry. They may be harsh. They may be sweet. They may be loving. You will see the poetry that moves through you. So I want to get back. How do I get imagery to express virtue? Robert Bly used to say, okay, can you draw a picture of that poem? How many times has he said that to you or I? Can you draw a picture of that line? We don't want to stay in the abstract, in the idea. We want to move into the picture because there's some sort of resonance and energy that moves through that picture. Just as we talked about last night, you know, we have labels that are insufficient. Well, the same goes for other labels. Even labels for virtues are insufficient. And we get stuck in this Christianized or uh, the old Greek, classical Greek language for virtue. And it doesn't work for me anymore. I saw these signs out here, responsibility way. Well, <laughs> a sense of responsibility is a good thing, but I wanted to throw up. You know, this is a yeah, maybe, you know, take, take care of your brother way. <laughs> something with, uh, with a little bit more uh, imagery yeah. in it. Yep. Hmm. Can I just say something yeah, about that? Um, there, there's something uh, dead and deadening about abstract language. Yep. Um, <clears throat> if, if the language is uh, unmoored uh, from its earthly references in things that we can sense and feel and, and touch and taste and see and hear, the poem tends to, and the language tend to float somewhere up here, but they never, they never get really below this this part of us and what poetry is trying to do is is activate the heart and the body physically through the use of sound imagination images so that flat line language of consumer society is is one of the great enemies of of poetry and also of the soul life and i would say that abstraction starts to negate and erode virtue. It keeps us away from those depths. As a poet, I try to enliven my poems with imagery. And when I start going down with straightforward abstraction, I'm starting to get pretentious, uh, pedantic, I wanted to study virtues after reading this book. And so I, start, I went out looking for poems about virtue. It's hard to find. However, I did find a, a poem by William Stafford. William Stafford writes poems with some of the greatest imagery. But let me read this to you. It's about the virtue of wisdom. It's entitled, The Little Ways That Encourage Good Fortune by William Stafford. Mm -hmm. 
Wisdom is having things right in your life and knowing why. If you do not have things right in your life, you will be overwhelmed. You may be heroic, but you will not be wise. If you do have things right in your life, but you do not know why, you are just lucky. And you will not move in the little ways that encourage good fortune. The saddest of those not right in their lives who are acting to make things right for others. They act only from the self. And that self will never be right. No luck, no help, no mm. wisdom. Mm. Harsh poem. Now, I love this poem. And I love the teaching in this poem. And yet... This is all abstract language. What picture could be painted from that poem? There's no imagery in that poem. That could be written down from the minister uh, and given to you at your confirmation. Um, or you might imagine an old sage yeah. sitting there in his robes exactly. uh, pronouncing the poem. And there's... there's great value in that there's great value but i'm a poet i want i want imagery to help me get a feel for for virtue he talks about the virtue of wisdom in that i want to give you a poem full of imagery that talks about virtue in a different way and this is the poem the Rights of Manhood by the great Canadian poet Alden Nolan. Thomas edited a, uh, a book for uh, 90s Press, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A yeah. Col collection of uh, his uh, poems. I think there might be a couple of copies downstairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Here goes Doug. <laughs> yeah? I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, li yeah. listen, you ain't heard nothing yet. Yeah. So I want you to think about this as, as I go through the poem. You know, where's the virtue in this poem? The rights of manhood. It's snowing hard enough that the taxis aren't running. I'm walking home. My night work's finished. Long after midnight with the whole city to myself. When across the street, I see a very young American sailor standing over a girl who's kneeling on the sidewalk and refuses to get up, although he's yelling at her, to tell him where she lives so he can take her there before they both freeze. The pair of them are drunk, and my guess is he picked her up in a bar. And later, they got separated from his buddies. And at first, it was great fun to play at being an old salt at liberty in a port full of women with hinges on their heels. But by now, he wants only to find a solution to the infinitely complex problem of what to do about her before he falls into the hands of the police or the shore patrol. And what keeps this from being squalid is what's happening to him inside. If there were other sailors here, it would be possible for him to abandon her where she is, and to joke about it later. But he's alone. And the guilt can't be divided into small, forgettable pieces. He's finding out what it means 
to be a man and how different it is from the way that only hours ago he imagined it. He made a choice despite all this fear of getting caught by the shore patrol. There was a bit of compassion in him. He had to make that choice to stay there. To help get her Jim, out. Yeah. Uh, could I add a poem? There's another approach to this. I think, uh, I don't know if Alden Nolan really planned to write a poem about virtue or no. not. I think he was fascinated by the perplexity and the complexity emotionally of that situation. Yeah. Virtue was something that really did come up a lot in his poems, though. Yes. But I actually, probably Tim, too, have set out sometimes to write poems that somehow embody or exemplify a virtue without necessarily talking about it abstractly. And this, right. is, this, is, a, this is one of mine. It's yeah. called Reverence. It, it, it connects directly to the book that Tim is relating, Woodruff's Reverence. Isn't that the one that got, yep. you, got you started right. really thinking about this? So I, I read that book, too, on Tim's recommendation, and I wanted to write a poem about reverence. And so this is what I came up with, and it has a dream in it. I'm back in my hometown, walking up Bridge Street past the St. Regis paper mill, where my grandpa, Smith, punched the clock until he retired. It's been too long since I've visited my grandparents. Weeks, even months I think of them in their small house across the alley from the park, in pine and cedar shade where those two old people live in the gathering silence of the end. My grandmother with her social hunger, my grandfather with his Milwaukee journal and cigar. What if they were to think I don't love them? The pain hits like an axe blow. I resolve to go knock on their door immediately. Some weight swings to, rebalances heaven and earth. I can't tell whether I'm awake or still asleep when I realize they've been dead for decades. Dear grandmother and grandfather, forgive my complaining when your, fa when your son, my father, sent me over to mow your lawn, rake your leaves, shovel your sidewalk, I couldn't imagine all three of you gone. I am better for living, though not in time, to give you the reverence which was your due and which I kept hidden from myself in my heart. I could, I could hear the gasps. So I guess I did but, use the word reverence in it, but it, it was really an attempt is. to give the feeling of mm, what it always yeah. seems to involve some kind of turn, doesn't it? Yes. A choice, you know, you can yep. either forget and be thoughtless or you can go on in the other there's direction. A, there's a choice <clears throat> with virtue. And if a person doesn't have virtue, we can't give it to them. If there's a little bit a virtue in a person. For instance, if you have a little bit of reverence, this poem suddenly resonates with your sense of reverence and it's go, you hear the gasp. Mm -hmm. If you have courage, you recognize courage someplace else. However, you can't tell by a person's face if they have courage. You can't even tell if that person has reverence. A good artist can illustrate emotion in a face. A good artist, a good painter, cannot illustrate a virtue in a person's face. Because a virtue is only recognized when it's in relationship with someone or something else. So the image 
of something that is virtuous. It's a virtuous act. It is a relationship. Courage. Reverence. Respect. Wisdom. Compassion. Any virtue, any label... And we all know what a virtue is. We struggle with the labels. But we can only recognize it when it is activated. Here's where the artist's intention comes in. I really wanted people to look at that poem through the lens of the element of reverence and the part that it played. Yes. Because reverence was the determining factor whether I would go and see my grandparents in the dream and let them know that I loved them and and revered them, which was something that when I was a teenager was very far from my you know, my conscious attention and intention. So I really want I really wanted it to be to be seen through that lens. Again, I, I mean, if, if I don't have the capacity for reverence, I wouldn't see it in a poem. I guess that's the that, point. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, okay. and a virtue is a capacity. Mm-hmm. In fact, this is Woodruff's definition of a virtue. A virtue is the capacity to have certain feelings and emotions when this capacity has been cultivated through training and experience in such a way that it inclines those who have it toward doing the right thing. For myself, here's my explanation. A virtue is the capacity to make a choice that reconnects one to the greater good. Or this morning, Francis used to the greater context or to the whole. So when we make a choice that reconnects us to the greater good, that greater good could simply be diving off the diving board. The courage that a a small child has to dive off the, the diving board. That choice is this is going to make me more alive. This is going to make me more adventurous. And it took an enormous amount of courage to do that. That's another thing about courage. We cannot compare types of courage. They're incomparable because they're immeasurable. Courage is courage. When Malala stood up to the Taliban in Pakistan. I salute her courage. I salute that over and over and over again. But there are so many other people who are also courageous that don't get the celebrity. She may be the role model for many women to come, and God, I hope so. Do we measure what Malala did to the 12-year-old who stands up to her stepfather and finally says, fuck you, you're not touching me again, asshole. Mm -hmm. Whose courage is more? Mm -hmm. We can't measure that. The virtues are immeasurable. And the virtues are there in the face of emotion, in the midst of emotion. It's the choice they make. I'll just throw a little wild card in here quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to ascribe courage or virtues only to human beings in the human world. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know how far it goes, but this is how far the French poet and philosopher Francis Ponge went with it. He yeah. said that things, that chair this microphone, uh, this notebook. He said that things were heroes for just being 
discrete objects with their own functions, their own integrity, and their own continuing retention of their forms. So, you know, he's, he's very existential, but it's an interesting way to look at the world, you know? I mean, there's a lot of courage in the walls, maybe. I don't see the oh, who knows? The choice to dissolve or not. I don't know. I, 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 you'd have to ask the chair. Yeah. It, and the chair has a different language <laughs> yeah, than we do. That's right. That's yeah. right. The shamans might understand it, though. Yeah. yeah. There's a temple in China that uh, is named uh, This Mountain Dares to Exist. Ah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. This mountain dares to exist. That's wow, great. Oh. Now, all of us men are in this room because someplace inside of us, we have virtue. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have virtue of some sort, whether it's courage, wisdom, compassion, whatever, whatever label you want to put on your personal virtues, that's fine. And we don't acknowledge virtue often we don't acknowledge courage and that's the role that we have to play as elders we have to acknowledge the virtues in the younger people because they're not readily visible to the world and we recognize virtue when it is an activity between two people we can recognize it and we have to point it out so that our young people say oh there is that good in me. I just made a good choice. That's how we worked with the young men in Red Wing. Whenever they made a good choice, we had to point it out because they were never told that they do make good choices, that they do have mm -hmm. virtues inside them. And sometimes you have to remind them over and over and over again, that was a good choice you made. That was a nice thing that you did when you went over and you put your arm around that other guy who was crying. The virtue is when you make the choice. Tim, would you, would you yeah. say that there's some element of virtue that's sort of internal to us, that's, that's native to us and born to us? I mean, I think... Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I can't remember the exact wording, but I know that the opening of Chaucer's prologue to the Canterbury Tales has a line in it about uh, virtue, the plant, the virtue of the plant engendered from the roots. I can't remember uh, exactly how that goes, but there's some sense that, you know, the virtue in the plant in springtime is, you know, something that comes proceeded directly up from the roots of the plant, from its inner being. There too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Am I right about that? Is that what that's saying? Yeah. 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 Engendered, engendered yeah. in the floor, yeah. the flower. Oh, right, right. right. Yeah. Her, okay. Whose virtue is engendered the flower? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yes. That's yeah. great. Thank you, Chris. I, I discern between um, recognized virtue by. It's not like you got a big can of courage on your back and you're going to face a situation and you're drawing on something you have. You're drawing, you're bringing it forth out of nothing. You have nothing and you're bringing it forth out of nothing. And when we're doing that, we're being most like the creator who brought something out of nothing. So virtues by their nature are uh, parts of life we bring forth in our own lives out of nothing, making what never could have been if it wouldn't have been for us. To choose to create courage when there was no courage there before, by our choosing. It bring it out of nothing. It comes from the inner part of us. Mm -hmm. Again, labels yeah. get in the way yeah. so often. And yeah. maybe there are maybe there are different just different kinds of courage too. Yeah. I just thought of a Mary yeah. Oliver line. She says, "Each body, each body is a lion of courage. Yeah. Each body is a lion of courage. Everyone." John point out that you know that so eloquently was pointed out by the virtue of wisdom that poem. Just because the author can write about virtues doesn't mean they possess them. <coughs> that's right. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing. I wrote this in this way. Virtue does not reside in the intellect. The intellect 
like the senses may inform the decision maker in a person. Yet the human being who makes a choice may not be especially intelligent. We all know virtuous people who do not have keen minds. We also know very intelligent folks who have no interest in virtue. <laughs> we know that. There's that classic Down syndrome adult who does the most compassionate thing for his neighbor. And we recognize that virtue when they, they perform the act. Tim, I'm really balked, uh, when you, we're talking about uh, choice and virtues. And I, I've seen it more as like a, a, a gift that comes from somewhere else that you don't have, but that you're blessed with. And often when somebody does something very heroic and they interview them on the news, and they just say, well, I just responded. I just did what I do. It wasn't like this choice I made where I know I could be consumed by this fire as well, but I'm going to run in there. It's like by virtue of them being a man or being uh, by virtue of it's, it's something that's given to you rather than what you chose. And that's why it's confusing with courage because I think choice is more. And I would say that that man made the choice. He didn't think, you know, in the face of all the terror, he made, he did make a choice. He could have stayed frozen. And I also agree, it is also a gift that came from the unconscious or from the deep part. And that man who ran into the fire to rescue probably has been practicing courage all his life. So it, same way, it's a practice. You train yourself. You just have a little bit as a child, or maybe you have a, a lot. But you access that. The intellect steps aside. And I, when I say there's a choice, I'm not saying it's an intellectual choice. I'm saying it's a soul choice. I, I should have made that clearer. Yeah. Marty? I, and I wonder if uh, virtue isn't soul stuff, you know, and that... And then this process, maybe what you're describing uh, as poetry, is is mining for that stuff, and you know, and cutting through that distance and that separation. And yeah. maybe you are born with it. Maybe yeah. you're just being true to yourself when catching your you're courageous at a given moment. Sure. Could I, could I yeah, just okay. respond something to that? I think that what's scary is the possibility. <clears throat> that you will not respond to the call or the challenge of your in, inner nature and inner virtue. And you have that choice too. And if you do that, that's the way of um, psychic death. Yeah. I think that uh, the environment potentiates the uh, opportunity for something to come from within. And that it is about a relationship between particular environments, sort of a archetypal field. You go into that field and suddenly it draws forth something that you didn't know was inside you. Mm -hmm. Like this conference. This conference draws things out of people, sure. virtues out of people yep. that didn't know that were there. Yep. Right. And the decision maker in your soul has a choice whether to come or not to come.